it is uh, a pleasure being here today uh, to share both the virtual and the physical uh, room of this conference with, with you all. Um, it, is, it is a strange feeling. Uh, I was expecting to have at least some uh, of the speakers of this uh, panel sitting beside me, in, but in fact, I'm just going to be interacting with them through the screen. But I guess after 18 months of, of pandemic, this shouldn't come as a, as a surprise, unfortunately. Uh, but we all do hope to be able to interact in person again uh, soon. I'm very happy to see that all of them are connected, that their videos are working fine, so we're all set up uh, to go. So this first panel, and uh, uh, it's actually good that we managed to start uh, about, you know, we're about 10 minutes ahead of schedule, which means we were going to have more time to interact with our speakers and uh, for you also to ask questions. But this first panel is really looking at um, threats, and both existing and emerging ones. Um, in a way, and for the past two decades, uh, uh, states have expressed their growing concerns uh, about recent developments in information and communication technologies, including for military purposes, which could be used to undermine international peace and security. However, uh, the pace of technological development that we've been witnessing for the past 20 years, you know, since these discussions on cybersecurity began at the UN, a lot has changed, uh, both at the, at the technology level, but also in the way in which technology has become embedded in society. But and last but not least, and related to that, uh, the ways and the, the means and the methods and the uses that both states and non-state actors make of such technologies, with harmful ICT incidents uh, increasing both in frequency and in sophistication, and constantly evolving and, and diversifying. It's the perpetuous cat and mouse situation where as attacks become more sophisticated, responses become better and more effective, and this leads to increased sophistication in, in the attacks. But if we look uh, at the uh, two most recent processes, the OWG and the GGE, so states, when it comes to the, uh, the issue of threats, and I've already agreed on, on several points, but I would say that most of these points pertaining, pertain to the characterization of the threat environment, uh, rather than uh, uh, referring to specific individual threats. Some of the main points uh, in this regard include uh, the acknowledgement of the increasing connectivity and reliance on information and communication technologies, without necessarily that uh, uh, accompanying measures to increase the security and the safety of these, uh, 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 of these new devices are met. Ensuring that vulnerabilities in the operational technology and the, in the interconnected devices and platforms and machines uh, are not exploited for malicious purposes has become an increasingly serious challenge. It's been acknowledged that an increasing number of states are developing ICT capabilities for military purposes, but also that a parallel trend is a continuous increase in incidents involving the malicious use of uh, ICTs by both states and non-state actors, including terrorists and criminal groups, who have increasingly demonstrated capabilities that until no long ago were considered to be uh, uh, predominantly available or exclusively available to, to states. There is an increased strong emphasis on, on the high risk and high impact of attacks against critical infrastructure and critical information infrastructure. And if anything, the COVID pandemic has demonstrated how this is uh, even more essential. But because this infrastructure is often owned, managed, or operated by the private sector, there is a growing realization of the importance of public-private cooperation to protect the integrity, the functioning, and the availability of such infrastructure. La, you know, last but not least, in this illustrative uh, list of uh, examples, um, states have acknowledged that you know, threat assessments vary by region, by state. Uh, and within regions and within state, what constitutes a threat can be a very different thing depending which group you're part of. And by group, uh, we mean both like which sector you're in, but also at the individual level, you know, the youth, the elderly, the women, men, vulnerable people, we're all experiencing or characterizing threat in a different way. And it is important to keep, to keep this in mind. However, and this is the, the kind of the, the bridge, until now we've been reflecting on what has been agreed and, and hopefully it should not be reopened. However, 
the, the chair summary of the OEWG gave us an opportunity to identify some additional areas of concern that were discussed by, by the group, but, but didn't find their way into the final report. And within these points, there are some very interesting kind of uh, uh, prompts for our speakers to reflect uh, on uh, issues today. So the stockpiling of vulnerabilities, uh, as well as the lack of transparency and defined processes or policies for disclosing them, uh, was considered a, a key area in the concept, context of threats, as well as the exploitation of harmful hidden functions, the integrity of the global ICT supply chain and data security. Information operations and disinformation campaigns were also discussed, but from a more uh, technology development perspective, um, there were four points that I think uh, stood out that I would be very interested in discussing with the speakers. So the pursuit of increasing automation and autonomy in ICT operations, uh, including by uh, the extensive use of machine learning, quantum computing, the proliferation of connected devices, the Internet of Things, and uh, I will add to that the Internet of Forgotten Things, which we can elaborate more uh, later. Uh, new ways to store and access data to different types of technologies, then being distributed ledgers or cloud computing, and of course the ever expansion of, of big data and uh, uh, increased digitized personal data. So a lot has been discussed, a lot has been agreed, but clearly there is still uh, a lot to follow up on. And this upcoming OEWG that we start in just over a week really offers uh, member states and, and all the stakeholders the opportunity to further advance discussions on existing and emerging threats. But where should it start and where should it aim to go? Uh, five years is, is a long time. So what, what kind of a, a roadmap should be, should be drawn, if any? Of course, I will not try to answer these questions by myself, but I'm very pleased to be uh, joined by three uh, excellent speakers who will help us uh, navigate this interesting topic. So I'm joined today by Serge Droz, who is the security lead for Problem Technologies and the chair of the Forum of Incident Response and Security Teams. Um, joined by Clara Jordan, the chief public policy officer for the Cyber Peace Institute, and by Anastasia Kazakova, who is the senior manager for public affairs at Kaspersky. So before I pose the first questions to our speakers and ask them to intervene, uh, I just wanted to remind once again how you can interact uh, with us, uh, which is through the use of the Slido platforms. Uh, you can, you know, if you're watching us online, you can simply scan the QR code you see on the screen or go to Slido.com and enter the uh, code that you see there. If you're in the room, the same instructions are printed and available on your desk. In fact, if you connect to the platform, there are already two questions um, that have been uh, uh, posed. So you can see what they are. You can add your own as you, as you wish. So hopefully over the course of the day, we will go over them all. So I'm just going to put my earpiece now and just do a quick uh, sound check to make sure that all of our speakers are connected and can hear me okay. Um, uh, uh, Anastasia, Serge, and Clara, are you, are you with us? Can you hear us okay? I can hear you perfectly. Perfect. Same. As well. Same here. Perfect. So, so far, technology is on our side, which is good. So, um, I, you know, in, in my opening remarks, I went over uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, threats, some of the issues that have already been agreed and identified by uh, the member states. So the first question that, that I ask, that I pose to the panel um, is, you know, should the threats that have already been identified be further defined, explored? And, and, and if yes, uh, how should member states aim to do that? Or if not, why do you think that what we have so far is enough? And perhaps we can discuss more what else needs to be, needs to be done. So this is really the first question that I have uh, for you all. Um, maybe I'll start with, with Serge, then Clara, and then Anastasia, and then for the next question, we, we, we change the order. Serge, you wanna go first? Yes, please. Thank you very much, Giacomo. Welcome everybody here also, a big welcome from FIRST. Uh, just to give you a little context, FIRST brings together instance responders. Think of us as the firefighters in the internet. We're usually the first ones on the ground when an incident happens. And I think the questions you asked uh, about what are the threats is a really interesting one. But I would suggest that we focus on the effects attacks have on victims because 
Do you stay mostly the same, or is the attacks seem to be changing quite a lot? You elaborated <laughs> earlier about uh, the quick pace at which the internet changes, but the effect at the end of the day is always the same. It's kind of the victims suffer, they lose, and we often also kind of have the wrong focus on the victims. I would argue most of the victims that are treated merely as collateral damage are actually members from civil society who increasingly depend on functioning telecommunications and infrastructures. So I think it is important to keep an eye on, on, on the attack methods, certainly keep an eye on, on game changers such as quantum computing, but, but also focus on what are the effects? Is, are these malicious operations uh, kind of proportionate? What is the damage they're creating? Far too often, I feel we, we kind of focus on this new attack, that new attack, and then I get into the headlines. But at the end of the day, it's always the same. It's people losing their information, their data, their private data, having disadvantages, not being able to, to function in life. And especially in emerging economies, there's an increase in dependence on, on very few digital kind of devices. And if you take these away, you create a lot of harm. I would like to leave it with that. Thanks. Thank you, uh, uh, Serge. Uh, Clara, you, wanna, you want to uh, take the floor and, uh, and give us your perspective on this kind of a general setting question? Absolutely. And thank you, Giacomo, for the opportunity uh, to, for Cyber Peace Institute to, to participate today. You know, I'll just want to really highlight and, and, and add to the point Serge made. You know, if you read through a lot of the way we think about the threat, we still think about the threat to the target. We don't talk about what the threat to the victims is. So from our perspective as an institute and our work, you know, really focusing on the effects of the, the attacks to the victims is key. I think there is four sort of general themes I want to quickly mention. And then I want to make a couple of comments as to where the threat could be sort of further defined comparing, you know, the report and where we are today. So I think there is there's four key sort of trends that I want to highlight on the threat landscape. One is, you know, humans continue increasingly to be in the crossfire of geopolitical conflicts. And, and this is key because, you know, these the, the impact goes for the human safety, security, and access to critical services. So really, we're violating, you know, sort of the rules and the norms across the board when humans um, are in the crossfire of these geopolitical conflicts. We know that we're seeing a proliferation of, you know, offensive cyber capability used um, for violations of human rights and fundamental freedoms. And this poses a, a huge threat, um, you know, to, to prosperity, to the ability of us to express human rights, you know, to the empowerment. I think the other um, important evolution we have to talk about today is the evolution of cybercrime. And it is getting to a point where, you know, you have a quadruple extortion, where the victimization goes beyond the target, right? It's not just the target it's attacked, but those, the impact on victims, it's not only in terms of their, you know, immediate human rights, safety and security. And we've seen, um, some very, very dramatic uh, and, and uh, absolutely heart crushing stories about the human impact of ransomware. But if you think about, you know, the data and, and the way it's held to ransom and, and it ends up in a dump site, you know, you have a potential for lifelong re-victimizations. And I would say, you know, really the, the, there is lots of initiatives and lots, lots, you know, going on sort of even in a way of, of uh, addressing the cybercrime uh, addressing some of these security issues, but I think we cannot lose a sight that at the end of the day, these initiatives are to protect human life and that in the process, we do not lose um, the open, secure, stable uh, and accessible ICT environments. Um, so now just very briefly to where I think the, the threats could be further defined, comparing it to the first report. Um, the report has this talked about that, you know, some non-state actors have demonstrated ICT capabilities previously only available to states. But I think it's also important to note that some states are using the tools and techniques and, and modus operandi used by criminal groups and engaging into behavior that's typically referred to as criminal, for example, extortion. 
And so I think it's really important that we recognize it because it's a key element of the way we address these threats, but also from the perspective of, of holding the perpetrators accountable and thinking about, you know, where the where the center of attention should lie. So that that is one area where I would where I would really encourage um, the states to to look into in terms of threat. And I think the other um, very quick quick area where I could see potential um, for improvement. You know, the report did talk about how malicious ICT activities against uh, critical infrastructure and critical infrastructure undermine trust and confidence in political systems and prosperity. But I think we also need to recognize that these malicious activities against critical infrastructure, you know, really impact human safety and security and, and human life. Now we have attackers coming after the hospitals, food and supply chains. And so the human life can be directly impacted, um, you know, on all fronts. Uh, when we talk about the, the, the other threats, your second sort of questions, I will actually talk a bit more about the, the critical information um, infrastructure and how actually that can impact um, safety and security. So really just to wrap up the, the first questions, I think we need to be clear that when we talk about the threat, we're talking about the way um, the indiscriminate and systemic you know, criminal and nation state activity continues to endanger human life and undermine the trust um, in technology. Thank you. Thank you, Clara. And uh, last but not least, Anastasia, um, as a, a Kaspersky being one of the, the, of the biggest cybersecurity uh, um, companies, we'd be very interested to get your perspective on, on these uh, threats as they've been defined so far. Over to you. Thank you so much. Um, for a start, I should also say that I'm really grateful to you, fabulous Unity team for gathering all of us uh, and so many people today to reflect on the cyber stability framework and global cyber stability issues. And today, I think we meet at a perfect time just before the new OWG starts its new process. Um, discussing threats, I would really agree here both with uh, Serge and Clary, they've said really important remarks, um, but just want to compliment here a little bit, um, also sharing the perspective that coming from the colleagues who work in this area day by day. Um, discussing threats, which are traditionally among the first sections in previous GG and OWG reports, we today for sure can reflect on what has happened since to those important achievements um, were possible. And here I refer to successful conclusion of both processes and the adoption of the reports. Well, as um, you all may say, probably since then, threats haven't been eliminated. Um, and what's even more, there's certainly more new threats and more new challenges which we need to deal with. And speaking of the UN cyber stability framework and looking at the latest reports, of course, the answer to the question, if the threats already identified should be further defined, the answer would be absolutely yes. What is even more, should there be new threats reflected? And again, we would probably say absolutely yes. My colleagues and practically people who work in this area day by day, who track IPT threat actors day by day, they have just published the overview for 2021. They also shared predictions for 2022. And then there we may see lots of the different threats um, analysis and uh, trends, such as the growing significant uh, role of the private sector in the threat landscape. And possibly the biggest story of uh, this year, uh, which is the investigation of the abuse of the Pegasus software targeting human rights activities, activists, journalists and lawyers, supply chain attacks, ransomware attacks have been another hashtag in this year's threat um, reports and um, investigations. And of course, the UN documents are diplomatic legal documents and we probably should not expect it to be too specific and detailed as the threat intelligence reports. Plus, we should also, I think, understand that the documents are then negotiated by different countries with the different views, capacities, and priorities. So for the document like this, I guess it's supposed to be with a high level elaboration. Nonetheless, I think there are still areas which would be um, benefit for further clarity and precision. And particularly, I think we still need a bigger focus on and a further discussion uh, in the threat sections on vulnerabilities and the existing common fundamental issue of vulnerable software and hardware which we increasingly rely on. And here I would 100% agree with you, Giacomo, that you said in your introductory remarks on that. How a vulnerability is handled by both states and non-state actors. This is important because in many cases, vulnerabilities and data exploitation serve as an entry point for further intrusion and operations. 
The other aspect which I, uh, seems to be overlooked in the previous reports is a threat which stemming from the exploitation of people and exploitation of the lack of cyber education, cyber hygiene across people, and the people are still the weakest link, opening the door to so many attack vectors. We also, um, the other speakers also highlighted uh, the point that this previous report said about the states developing ICT capabilities for military purposes. But I think, again, the discussion is open on how this trend does create a threat and what negative effects to cyber stability can be in this regard. We see that in more and more states publicly announced the cyber military operations, commands and strategies but I assume that they do so to, to defend themselves, to protect the assets, the citizens, how is actually a threat and the cyber stability. And if we are more clear about this as a global community, then we, I think, clearly understand what is the, those action areas we need to work on collectively. And also, in the event of a cyber conflict and a significant cyber attacks, attacking critical infrastructure, this is specifically a really important topic for us I think the lack of the clear framework which would guide the behavior of states and non-state actor, actors in the event of such uh, cyber emergencies could also be not a sort of a threat, but a challenge which uh, may lead to the further threats or make existing uh, threats become. And the last two points, um, also wanted to highlight that I think the threats could additionally come not just from the use of technology, how it is stated in reports, but from existing and efficient policies and attempts to regulate our technology, and specifically existing risks of further fragmented states' approaches to regulate still globally developed, globally distributed, and globally consumed technology. Um, and a final note, more a structural comment um, about the overall reports, if we we'll look at them in both GG and RWG, we see that the threats provide quite a really broad overview of those existing, emerging, and potential threats which the international community faces in cyberspace. However, at the same time, if we look at the further sections, we see that those threats, which states highlighted as urgent and important, they are not directly addressed in sections with recommendations, in the sections on capacity ability or confidence building measures. So structurally speaking, I think an approach where recommendations are linked to the threats, where the states highlight and see as important, this approach could be more focus oriented and perhaps could be more understandable in terms of what was a global community should do to address which threat and how this particularly will help us to improve in a particular area and overall in, cyber st in cyberspace. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Anastasia, for uh, you know, highlighting very, very important questions. Sometimes you know, when people think about threats, they, they do that, of course, through the lenses of the technologies, what is the latest attack that we're not yet ready to respond to. But of course, uh, uh, fragmented uh, um, regulatory frameworks or fragmented capabilities to be able at the governance level, at the state level, to deal with these issues can also uh, uh, introduce regulatory loopholes that can then be exploited by malicious actors um, in, in the conduct of their operations. And also, thank you for raising the importance of, of education uh, as a or uh, uh, the, the education for the for the general public as well uh, as a potential uh, uh, risk factor in in a way i think this is really important every time that i have the opportunity i stress the point and i'm going to do that in this occasion as well which is every time that we are prompted to update our cell phone or our laptop and we say postpone or snooze we are introducing potentially a vulnerability in the system. So it's really you know, uh, uh, up to us to be uh, responsible users of the digital ecosystem. And uh, you know, we are the first line uh, respondents. So I'm really interested then later on perhaps to, to uh, ask Serge what, what he thinks. Because of course, working in incident response, you often have to, to deal with, the, with the, uh, the fallout that emerges from uh, 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 an attack, and I'd be really interested in knowing your perspective on what is the the, the role of the of the the general public in that. But um, uh, Anastasia, you also kind of set the scene well for you know what are the gaps, what has been missing, what should be potentially further reinforced 
going forward. So I'm going to use that as a way of transitioning, giving the floor back to, to, to Clara and see, uh, you know, what, I, what is your perspective? What, you know, be, beyond what has already been agreed that could be further refined? What else, what, what is missing? What are, what are the gaps? You know, as, as, a first, uh, as a first point, I did have the same sort of the threat from the lack of cyber hygiene, you know, the, I don't want to frame it as a threat from the user, but basically the threat from the lack of awareness, capacity and capability, uh, you know, in a more, more sort of general population. So I will not belabor that point that was fantastically made already. So I'll, I'll highlight two points. One is sort of the, the, the threat to, to, fr from a, a uh, types of attacks, but the other one I think that has to be addressed is the threat from how we are dealing with the threat landscape. Um, so, so really the first sort of group of threats that I think should be further addressed and explored is, is the threat from disinformation and weaponization information. And this is a twofold, I see this as a twofold threat. First of all, you know, this information about geopolitical events, the level of the threat, the way overall cybersecurity issues are presented, and, and really the, the, the disinformation about it, they have significant impact on the perspective of the threat, and therefore it's understanding by decision and policymakers, which in turn can impact and influence the way, you know, or the urgency by which they take the measures um, to decide on, on the cybersecurity measures, or you know, on their motivation to help perpetrators accountable. So I think really the way you know, we're seeing this information and weaponization of information about threats, trends, cybersecurity being really a problem or not can really impact the way decision makers think about their role, what they should do. But also I think it, it can really you know, I think and really influence and impact the way, you know, states think about the urgency of implementing, for example, their commitment or what would work or what not wouldn't work. So really focusing on this information beyond the importance of, of it for, you know, for our democracy and political processes, but the way it, it can impact the, the understanding of the threat and motivation to implement the commitments, for example. Um, the other part of this information and weaponization information, you know, that has to be really addressed um, is that if this information as a direct threat to human security and safety, um, you know, we've seen cyber attacks and disinformation campaigns, you know, they are not only distinct digital threats, they are done in conjunctions where, you know, cyber attacks are done as a means to steal or plan targeted information. And when I talk about the weaponization, what I mean that we're continue to see you know, the, the hacks and leaks where a, a factually correct information is being weaponized, taken out of context and then used for malicious purposes. Um, you know, we've really seen this in the context of pandemic. You know, the data was stolen from European Medicines Agency, later leaked online. And the way these things sort of cause doubt about the authority of different organization, the efficiency of um, vaccine or the threat of the pandemic can actually have real impact on, on human life um, in terms of dealing with this, you know, particular pandemic. So I think the, you know, the disinformation operations are, are really um, capitalized from this, this environment that is already saturated with information. We know the WHO has uh, referred to this as, as infodemic, but this is really a threat, a direct threat to human safety and security that has to be um, addressed uh, in, you know, I would hope to see um, sort of this address. I think the important thing that should be highlighted and looked at by, by state is really this clear understanding between the cybersecurity and this information and weaponization information, because the way this information is oftentimes obtained is through a, I will call it a hack, but it's, you know, I, I know, um, it's not a term of art, but just, just for the, the facility of the conversation. And so really ensuring we understand the, the importance between the resilience and this information we connect this to, and we don't treat these as two separate issues or separate processes, but sort of the, the way they really connect and reinforce each other. The second threat I wanna highlight is, is really a, a, an overall threat to stability of ICTs. And uh, for me, it comes from the way we're dealing um, with cyber threat. So currently what I have been observing is really the threat of militarization of cyberspace where um, 
fighting cybercrime and ransomware and sort of this overall threat that it poses to, to human rights um, and expression, you know, the freedom of expression and privacy. I think we've currently seen, I mean, I think that the group here really recognizes that the ransomware is a, is a scourge and it's a little surprise that governments are using an array of, of tools um, in their toolbox to, to fight it. And, but now we're seeing the initiatives across the globe uh, where um, you know, military capabilities or authorities are being proposed uh, to be fighting cybercrime. And so I think the, the, there's, this is a very concerning response um, because we believe that this should be a law enforcement matter. And uh, where law enforcement tends towards more gathering evidence, uh, doing you know incident response, or seeking you know the arrest and 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 investigations, we think that and and we are observing from the past that the tools that are being you know used by the sort of the military arms of of governments, they are more used on disruption of operations and inf infrastructure with the potential of unintended consequences um, due to the interconnected nature of our systems. I also think that using, you know, the, the military tools and capabilities and authorities to, to fight ransomware also sends a wrong signal uh, when we think about reducing risk to peace, stability and security. And I think it runs contrary to the spirit of what many governments, industry and civil society is trying to achieve. Um, I think it's important to recognize that transitional crimes, they often surpass the capabilities of law enforcement. But for me, this is an argument for greater collaboration, both internationally and public-private um, collaboration within the governments. So, you know, it is the right thing to do everything we can to stop ransomware. But I think in the peacetime, our effort should be really led by um, law enforcement. We do have very successful precedents of collaboration, you know, the, the takedowns of um, major dark web marketplaces, arrest operation, uh, we have disruption. So we should really focusing on how we can use better the tools we have, um, really zoom on into the collaboration uh, rather than, um, rather than uh, considering, um, considering other tools. Just to close, and, and I really want to reinforce this point, you know, the, the argument that ransomware is a national security threat and a human security threat is very valid and merits clear actions. But again, I, I would really encourage the, the community to highlight that there is a threat from over using the military capabilities to, to deal, to deal um, with these threats and really thinking about how we can maximize um, the law enforcement tools, the private-private cooperation uh, before we start to explore other options. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Clara. And thank you also for bringing uh, to the table one of the issues that we're going to be discussing later today, which is, of course, we're now be focusing, talking primarily about the OEWG, but just a few weeks after the first substantive session of the OEWG, um, you know, in you know, COVID permitting in, in January 2022, uh, the first uh, uh, session of the ad hoc committee that has been established by the third committee of the General Assembly uh, will start its, its works to, to, to discuss potentially, uh, potential elements to, to include in a, a cybercrime convention. So uh, clearly there are overlaps. Um, uh, you know, I see international cybersecurity and cybercrime as you know, very basic Venn diagrams in a way that they, they each have their own unique characteristics, but there is clearly an area of overlap and um, threats is potentially uh, one of them. So the, te the threat element, the not only the technologies, but also the impact, the actors, is definitely uh, an area of uh, overlap. And is uh, looking forward to, to discussing more uh, how to disentangle, if, if you want, uh, um, uh, the criminal element uh, from the, the international security element later today. Um, I want to go back to, to, to Serge and see if you have any uh, uh, views on uh, other reacting to what uh, Anastasia and, and Clara have been saying, but also your own views on what, what are the gaps, what, what more could be added to the current discussions to really take this forward. Thanks, Giacomo. Clara and Anastasia have said most of the things, but I, since you asked for the gaps, I think that is a very, very important thing because a lot of the discussions we lead today seem to be very reactive. Uh, we look at uh, we look at events that have happened and we tend to, to be very biased. Uh, a recent study, for example, investigated uh, 
what is the victim landscape in the different reports? And what was found was actually quite shocking because most of the threat intel reports available from commercial companies kind of cover attacks on other commercial companies or states, but they always leave out civil society, not because they're not interesting or, or so, but probably because these are victims that are not potential customers. So the private sector has a, has a, a strong bias. And if you just take that output to create our kind of threat landscape, we're going to miss out on a lot of things. I think that is, is one of the, of the challenges that we really make sure that we, that we accept the fact that information is biased. That this also ties into the misinformation uh, theme that Clara mentioned. I mean, there, there is deliberate misinformation, but there's also a lot of it, misinformation or that is just stuff we ignore because we, it's not sexy. Right now, everybody talks about ransomware. It's, but ransomware is not the biggest threat we face. Roman scam, which is really something super boring. It's been existing since hundreds of years. Roman scam, I remind you, is uh, someone pretending to be interested in you and, and then scamming you. It's producing more damages financially than ransomware. And, but of course, the victims are not big corporations. Victims are individuals. And we tend to forget these because they're technically not very interesting. They're not really sophisticated. Yet they're really, really hard to combat. And I think one of the challenges we have in cyberspace is that kind of our traditional notions of conflict kind of start to blur. In kind of 50 years ago, there were certain things states would do to each other. We would call it war, espionage, these type of things. But they were clearly in the state domain. And then there were criminals, and then there were kind of these type of things which were really separate, which were left to law enforcement. But these days, these things start to merge. If you take the, this year's kind of vulnerabilities in Microsoft Exchange servers, what we saw is that first this was used by a state for an espionage, presumably espionage campaign, but then it was taken over by criminals. So it's the same vulnerability, it's the same attack, and then was used for ransom to deploy ransomware and things like this. So. This mixture really makes it very, very difficult. I, I totally support Clara's uh, vote for make sure we don't militarize cyberspace too much. Let's, not, let's make sure we don't turn the internet into a war zone. I think this is a very, very strong thing. Yet at the same time, it also means that we have to res restrain ourselves from just a quick profit. Hey, there is a vulnerability where we as a state can gain a profit because you you cannot separate this from cybercrime. I welcome very much that we have the ad hoc committee on cybercrime alongside the open-ended working group. But I really feel these, these people should spend a lot of quality time together because a lot of what, what they are doing is not just merely interacting. It's kind of the different side of the same metal. Thank you, Serge. And I'm actually going to use something you say to, to transition us to, to the next question. And I'm very pleased to see that on the on the Q&A platform, there are quite a few that I'm going to, uh, shortly, I'm going to, to uh, transfer to you but uh, as a panel. But, you know, the, one of the biggest difference of this upcoming open-ended working group compared to uh, all of the previous ones is the length of the mandate. We are looking at a five-year uh, uh, process. And five-year in technology, it's a long time. If we compare where we were five years ago, to where we are now, uh, it's a different world. Pandemic aside, it would have been already a different world if you know the, the digitization process had just followed the, the trend that was anticipated, but then of course uh, COVID was a, a catalyst for digitization worldwide. But even without the pandemic, the world in 2021 would have been very different from the world in 2016. So if we project ourselves to 2025, it is reasonable to assume that technological developments will continue. Uh, and increasingly, and I always use this example, when the first smartphone was launched, it had a disruptive impact on society and the world. But the technologies that were included, they weren't necessarily new, but it was the first time that they were combined in a single device. You had a digital camera, you had a phone, a, a digital screen, 
and the ability to connect. All of those things were already available. They were just brought together in one device for the first time. And this is kind of a, a very simple example of what technological convergence can achieve, right? So you mentioned, the, uh, Serge, the, the, the importance of people as being, you know, uh, uh, targeted uh, and potentially, you know, still the weakest link. It's something that, that, that Clara also mentioned uh, before, and Anastasia alluded to it as well. We've seen earlier this year, we had another flagship event, the Innovations Dialogue, that explored uh, deepfakes as an example of what, you know, increasingly sophisticated AI could bring in terms of uh, uh, the production of uh, forged or synthetic, synthetic media, which present a potential new way of conducting very sophisticated phishing attacks against people that are no longer you know, equipped necessarily to distinguish, you know, or, or, or the level of uh, uh, literacy that is going to be needed in the future to distinguish between, uh, 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 if you want, a real uh, message, whatever it's written, recorded, video, audio, and and a fake one or a forged one, is the bar is is increasing. So, all this to say, what is your your perspective on how important is it going to be? for a process that has an end game in five years to remain uh, not only aware, but proactively try to understand what kind of new technological developments are likely to land on the market. And more importantly, how are these new uh, developments going to impact societies and therefore the, 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 the safety and, and security of, of the digital ecosystem? Um, Serge, because I see you on the screen, maybe you want to go first and then we go Anastasia and then Clara. Thank you. I think it's indeed, it's very much of a challenge. And I think the challenge is going to be to find the game changers. And 10 years ago, no one would have predicted what the mobile phone did to us. So it's just like, I think the iPhone was released 11 years ago. It's unbelievable. It's, you could not imagine a society without mobile phones anyways. And predicting this is really, really going to be very hard. But what we are talking about is, is norms for responsible behavior. It's not norms for responsible technology. It's really the behavior thing. So we get all these great tools and it's, I'm a security guy, so I tend to see the world kind of in a rather dark kind of colors. But in fact, the internet has been a real success and that's what we need to focus on. And I think that that is maybe also a chance having a five year framework where people really can start thinking a little bit about what is it we actually want to achieve with this and, and what are new technologies? What can, what good can they do for us? And what is really things we should, we should stay away. And we've been doing this with other things. There's a, we have technical capabilities in traditional warfare that we as a society and, and we as a, a union of states have decided we don't want to use be these biological weapons, be these chemical weapons. States decided they don't want to use this, but they're available. So I think that is, is the aim we need to go, keeping, in, keeping the developments in, in mind, keeping the new, the new capabilities in mind. It's a, I think no one can really read the future. That is a bit of a challenge if you want to make future-proof norms and regulations. But I think it's important that that these conversations are about the values we share as huma humans and, uh, um, and not so much about the technology. Thank you. Um, Anastasia, you want to go next? I, I should say that what Serge has said has a lot of actually um, sounds inspiring and thought provoking and I really like the point that we actually being reactive in most cases and quite biased, focusing on a particular threats, which uh, right now we news break in the media. Um, and suddenly, I think we're still not focusing much on the lack of particular processes and the, well, different basically processes and procedures um, that also lead to the threats, uh, which is the lack of the reporting, how could we better know uh, what actually is going on with victims, if the victims sufficiently report and let us know how the particular use of technology creates a threat. 
if the law enforcement cooperate eff efficiently together. I know that uh, some of these questions also part of the fair committee, pro uh, fair committee process, and he also agreed that there's a lot of overlaps, and it's uh, I think it's also one of the challenges if we will be able to merge and make sure that they are consistent and harmonized, uh, and that's also would define our ability to um, discuss su successfully all of these threats. At the same time, I think we have to be realistic that we'll not be able to cover all possible threats, and it shouldn't be the goal. Um, the document, once agreed by states, would probably become obsolete a couple of weeks later already. So, um, and I hear I think the possible solution could be twofold. Um, first, I would refer to what Serge initially said about the effects. It's really critical to ensure a technology neutral approach, meaning that we'll look at the effects which the use, of the, uh, the use of technology leads to, why and how it's harmful to international security in this, instead of focusing on a particular form of methods used like ransomware supply chain attacks. The second element I think is more organizational one, to be constantly in the loop of the recent threats and having the recent knowledge of intrusions, TDPs, um, of threat actors, um, as well as any developments in the cyber offensive operations even. I think it's important to have a diverse set of people and experts who will help with different insights uh, and different intelligence. No one vendor has a complete 100% understanding of what's going on globally in the threat landscape, neither Kaspersky nor I believe any other vendor. So making sure that you have a diverse and a trusted group of people and the experts coming from different backgrounds, private sector, academia, and technical community that could help and guide states um, in this constantly updating threat intelligence and threat modeling, uh, which usually digital experts uh, initially start with, understanding what would be the further roadmap uh, securing the technology. I think this could be an organizational setup and a solution to, um, to this challenge. Thank you. Uh, uh, Clara, you want to go? One perspective I want to start with, which is, you know, we always talk about the advances in, in capabilities and technology as if they were only giving, you know, the, the upper hand to the attacker. You know, I think there is the both the attack and the defense side evolve. And I even want to say, you know, sort of hand in hand. Um, I think we are losing right now for different reasons. But when we think about technological advances, I just want to highlight that it's both sides that are evolving and that both sides can use you know, those capabilities to, to their benefit. Um, I think the second point, which is not really a cybersecurity, you know, related issue, but to me it is, and it should be respect, you know, thought thought through and including in these in these conversations is, you know, nothing is more easily exploited than the human mind. And this doesn't only goes into the you know the conversation about disinformation and weaponization of information, but it also goes into you know, the way we are building a society to have critical thinking, um, you know, to have critical thinking about what, how we consume, you know, ask ourselves the question, why someone is revealing this information to us? You know, you talked about the deep fake. So I think if we have, if we work on a society that's resilient, both on a cybersecurity front, but also, you know, hand in hand, you know, have that critical thinking, work on that human mind. I mean, that is the resilience that can help us, you know, um, work and address the threat or become more resilient to it. Um, so that's for me something to think about. And, and it should it should marry dimension because, again, it's, it's not we can't decouple um, these things at all. You know, you, you did mention, the, you know, the convergence. I really think that that's the way to think about development of technology and development of the threat. It's not about what, you know, a driverless car or automated, you know, sewage system will give to us. It's when you put it together in infrastructure, how can the, th you know, how can the, the, the threats or, or an attacks cascade? What are the vulnerabilities that can really have cascading effects? while keeping in mind that the first and foremost objective should be to protect and secure the individual at the end. And I think if we think about the way not of protecting the systems, but protecting the users, I think that is a mindset 
you know that can really help us um you know help us to to work through the through the evolutions and i mean this goes for a lot of the technologies you mentioned i mean if you you know think about you know people talk about 5g perhaps even way too much you know for, for me what it what it really means that there is going to be more connecting industries and geographies as, as communities it's going to yes alter the threat landscape but again it is you know we are evolving on the both sides. So it's if we have the right mindset, if we if we keep the individual, you know, if all these decisions are human centric, if we if we think about you know what convergent does to the user, um, and we work on that sort of I don't like the term, but whole of the society approach where you where you build up the critical thinking, what the threat is, how do I think about security, why is someone you know revealing this information to me you know let's ask ourselves those critical questions you know the way we think about you know geopolitical context and security let's let's think about why we are how we are consuming what we are consuming because it doesn't only shape the individual it shapes every single policymaker who will then make those decisions accordingly thank you thank you so we have about uh, uh just over 15 minutes left on, on this panel. And I, I wanted to start transitioning to some of the questions that we've been receiving by the audience. And uh, I'll read and then I'll explain the, the, the first one a little bit or I'll put it into context. But um, the first one that I, that I have here um, is, it reads as follows. So a lot of attacks are possible due to the extreme negligence of various tech vendors. Would something like the successful ISO uh, uh, 2701 be helpful for these cases? So because I'm not expecting everybody in the audience to necessarily be familiar with, uh, uh, with the specific standard, we can generalize it a little bit more and say that, you know, um, we've talked at the beginning about the proliferation of connected devices. Um, I mentioned the Internet of Forgotten Things, that are all of the things that are connected that people forget about. Uh, and there are many, and increasingly so. But I think that when it comes to tech vendors and industry players, um, people, you know, the general mindset is to, to, to associate industry with the big tech companies. I don't think necessarily that the big tech companies are the ones that need to be convinced that cybersecurity is important. It's probably, as there is a push towards making everything more connected, from the toaster to the fridge to the car to pretty much everything. It's probably those vendors that are, have been traditionally operating in a non-connected world that are now offering products that are connected that probably would require uh, specific attention. And when it comes to threats, I think that so far, at least in the discussions, um, uh, you know, with the exception of the acknowledgement in the context of protection of critical infrastructure that private sector sometimes or well, often either owns or manages uh, uh, or operates the infrastructure. Um, the primary focus has been on what states can do and should do. So it's a very state-led type of approach. What is the, in the ends of state? But this, this question allows me to ask to all of you as a panelist, um, when it comes to the prevention of, of, of threats, so uh, risk prevention uh, rather than response, how would important would it be for uh, uh, states to look at something like industry standards that have been developed you know, or agreed uh, uh, by industry uh, or other types of, of measures that have been agreed outside of the kind of the, the, the strict circle of states? How important would, the, would this be to somehow prevent threats from actually materializing in the first place. So almost like the reinforcing the security by design, which was a very fashionable term in, you know, until a few years ago, and then somehow uh, you know, uh, uh, was replaced by other things. But in general, what is your approach on the importance for states to leverage non-state-led initiatives like the establishment of industry standards? Yeah, I leave the technical standards to, to Anastasia because um, although I did spend quite a lot of time in the industry, I think she has the, the most up-to-date sort of thinking. I mean, one thing I'll say, look, there, there's really interesting government initiatives across the world that they are trying to do that. So it, it's not that whether we should do it. I think that's been established that we should do it and that the government has a role to impose and enforce and encourage those standards, incentivize, collaborate and help the industry to do that. But I think I'll say 
when we talk about those standards, we talk mostly about safety and security. But I also would like for the governments to, to think about how we can think about the human rights, privacy, and these other issues. You know, we have the UN guidelines on, on human rights and businesses. I'm sorry, I don't know the, the exact word. You know, right now it's, 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 um, it's just guidelines. Why don't governments really think about how these can be part of, you know, sort of mandatory things to do business on in one country's territory? You know, so I think going beyond standards are an established good practice. There, there should be more and there is really good initiatives, but let's go beyond, you know, safety and security and think about, you know, the, the human rights aspect of technology and the way that can impact individuals globally. And let's work those into those regulations and, and um, mandatory structures. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anastasia, you want to go next? I think the question also interesting, but it has an economic, probably the global dimension, not only the dimension of international security and peace. So I will probably try to merge those two aspects. Well, certainly states can do a lot um, in securing the products that the modern products that we use. And we actually have already the elaboration coming from the recent GG report where states have agreed on what particular st steps states can do to ensure the integrity of supply chains or responsible reporting vulnerabilities. The question is, do we sufficiently know how those um, normal operation points are implemented currently? And I think it will definitely, we would benefit all knowing what are the approaches different states and different regions are actually taking right now. And we see indeed that there are many different national um, initiatives coming more and more from the US, from the European Union to secure connected devices, IoT, uh, we see that some of them are really harmonized, um, some of them less harmonized, and we specifically discuss this within Geneva Dialect. This is the process led by the Swiss government and the Diplo Foundation to understand how all of these emerging regulatory national approaches will be actually coexist with each other. Because again, I'd just like to highlight is it is a challenge that would actually create, uh, might create a threat as well. Um, but again, also the question to how states and the industry and then here in industry also understand not only the big tails, uh, big players, of course, but small and medium enterprises. And this is question especially important for the European Union and the European continent, how they could together um, more efficiently talk to each other to secure all of these services and products. Well, there's a lot of ideas currently uh, being discussed. They already did some good practices. Um, taken from the more global processes, Paris call, um, and specifically there's a key example how the government actually united different industry, non-state actors, civil society, technical community, and other governments to discuss lots of the issues. And there's a particular principle on life cycle security, which um, has been discussed within one of the working groups um, where we are part of. And we also try to decide to actually understand how different stakeholder groups could already take different positive security uh, steps already today to build stronger security for supply chains. So um, again, there's a lot of different initiatives we may probably not even know, but lots of them. And I think the one of the elements to great efficiency is to talk to each other to more and actually contribute to greater humanization to what's going on at the state level and the industry level in different parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Serge, what is your perspective? It sounds like a simple question, but if you start starting it, it actually becomes very, very complicated. So this question uses the word negligence, but I would, I would argue that's probably not quite true. A lot of organizations, a lot of small and medium enterprises, they're not negligence. It's just too difficult of a job for them to do. And again, that's nothing new. A hundred years ago, companies would produce their own electrical power. We've moved away from that. It's because why? Because it's expensive, but also because it's difficult to do in a safe manner. So a lot of these things have been outsourced. That's what we do with cloud computing. Cloud computing is not going to solve everything because you cannot move kind of a, a hospital machine into the cloud or you cannot move an airplane into the cloud. So there is going to be challenges. But I think the key to that is actually coming up with business models that, that make sure uh, that these services are safe and secure. So I think that that is one day, one part. Certainly standards are going to play a role in that, but they're not going to be the silver bullet that solves all of our 
our problems. And, and then also again, and that brings us back to kind of where we started here. If you have what's called a zero day, a new vulnerability that no one's ever seen before, the best senders are not going to protect you because then it's up, up in states to actually be transparent and say, hey, we found a big security hole. Let's not use this to our own advantage, but let's make sure we fix this before more damage is created. Thank you. Um, so the, I'm going to go with the with the next question and uh, uh, Serge, stay there because I'm going to go back to you first as a, a, a try to take a, a stab at it. Um, and it goes to uh, you read as follow. How serious is the threat of quantum computing to the future of cybersecurity and or international stability? I mean, that is a big <laughs> there's a big question. It would be perfect. Uh, uh, PhD dissertation topic for any student that is still thinking about it. But, you know, from a technical perspective, and then I, I like uh, Anastasia perhaps to come in uh, as well, but from a technical perspective, how would you characterize the potential impact of quantum on everything we've been discussing? Let's just kind of recall what threat quantum computing actually poses. Today, all we know is that once quantum computing becomes a reality, all the cryptographic algorithms we use to secure the internet will be worthless. So there's no, there's no more secure connection to your e-banking account. All of these things will go away. And indeed, this is a threat. But there's actually a piece of good news, and that's that quantum computing is only going to be feasible in about 10 years. And we can do a lot in 10 years. In fact, a lot of companies are working on the problem. Uh, and we are creating quantum-resistant Al encryption algorithms and and I think we've there's a really super good chance that we actually going to be in in a position to do this in 10 years and remember we, we had this big unknown before there was the Y2K problem for people old enough to remember when when the dates shifted from kind of the 1900 something to the 2000s and, and we were all afraid that a lot of software was just using the last two digits and will crash everything once we go over to zero, zero, and nothing happened. And the reason nothing happened wasn't that we exaggerated. The reason was that people had time to prepare and did. So I think we have fantastic engineers on this planet. And so quantum computing for me is actually a cool problem because it's interesting and I'm super confident we can solve it. Thank you. I always like positive attitudes towards, towards technology. Um... Uh, Anastasia, you want to go uh, next? Unfortunately, I do not remember this um, problem that Serge mentioned. I could only read uh, from the different sources. It was actually the year when I just first to the first class at my school. Uh, but it's it definitely it's one of the issues, and it actually reflects how rapidly the technology is being developing right now. And speaking of the cloud computing, we would be actually speaking again with something that may actually become obsolete in a different. Um, months and some months and some years already and here i would refer to the point which clara said before it's important to make sure that we have those people who develop the technology that also keeping in mind the different right now ethical and human aspects it's no longer possible to just develop technology as just something as a binary and being locked in a room we've been off uh, quite often told that our policymakers need the input from the technical experts, but the vice versa to, um, dialogue is also quite crucial and it's becoming more and more crucial today. The Those who develop technology need also the inputs hearing from the policymakers, academia to understand the policy and the human aspects. And I think it's one of the also elements that should be considered while further studying the cloud computing and the societal impact. Thank you. Uh, just want to go to, to, to Clara. I'm actually linking to something that you said previously where you know, technology is always available to both sides of the equation. You know, we shouldn't necessarily see quantum as a, something that is going to be only a threat because it's going to be used by malicious actors or to pursue malicious intent, but it's also a potential capability of, the, uh, 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 of those that instead are perhaps trying to prevent or respond to uh, uh, malicious actors. So perhaps all of the encryption that is now making malicious actors feel protected m might not be uh, as effective once uh, the uh, the good people have quantum computing available so it's it's always like two two sides of the same coin but would you have uh, uh, something to to add on the quantum issue 
I mean, just very briefly, you know, I, I wish I had the capacity and capability to comprehend and sol solve this problem. Uh, but I know there are great minds working on it, as, as both um, Anastasia and, and Serge said. But I, I say one thing. You know, if we say that encryption and, and privacy and everything it enables, you know, the freedom of expression, the commerce and, you know, technology is not an end in itself. It enables something. So if we say, you know, we really care about encryption because this enables us to operate as societies, really, then let's not be hypocritical and talk about ways how we can weaken the encryption, even the one we have today. So I think my, you know, my call in this context would be to really say that let's talk about what are priorities for us. And I think if it's something is going to be priority, such as strong encryption, then let's use the resources to really help the research, help the deployment, help the communities that work on it. And let's not spend you know, time talking about how we can weaken what we already have. So that, that is just my only point, sort of from a more... Um, a, a bit higher than it and I wish I could respond to to this question but that is unfortunately not my area of expertise thank you um, so I think we have time for one last uh, uh, question which uh, uh, is interesting because um, it's you know it's addressed to to search but I think it applies to to all of you or try to read this from your perspective and, and see what what you think about it so you know, if we this follows up to something that Serge mentioned about the fact that you know security or secure by default or, or by design uh, can be indeed hard and a complex thing to achieve for some companies. But so, would requiring vendors to quote make it easy to update their product quote uh, instead be helpful? So, if you can't necessarily put on the market something that already ticks all the boxes uh, when it comes to, to, to security by design would instead a more kind of a, a, a facilitated update, a facilitated in, you know, uh, post-sale engagement, if you want, uh, uh, help in this, in this regard, and, and if so, how? So maybe because, Serge, this was addressed to you, maybe you want to go first and then we, we, we go to, to, to Clara and then Anastasia and then we, we wrap up. I really do feel we quite often have this tendency to put the whole burden on the user. It's kind of the stupid user who clicked on that phishing mail or the, the evil person who forgot to update her phone or something like this. And clearly, that's not the solution to better security. I mean, we can't blame the non-experts for failures because we write bad software. Sorry, sorry, my fellow engineers, that's not the way how it works. And so I, I think it's very much the case that we need to have the secure by design, these, these services that, that really take away the burden. And if, some, if someone clicks on a phishing mail, we maybe should think of having an infrastructure that makes sure we're not ruined and don't have big problems afterwards. But obviously we cannot come up with a system that is completely foolproof. And again, if you go to the, the everyday life, it's like crossing a street is always dangerous. So as, as pedestrians, we always have, have to check if a car is coming. Yet at the same time, we try to build roads that, that make it easy for people to see an approaching car. We try to build cars that if, you, if they create, are involved in an accident, don't really create too much damage. But it's gonna be a mixture. But I'm 100% I'm on this take away the, the responsibility for security from the end user. Thank you. Anastasia, you want to go for uh, 30 seconds on this? Those who ask this question, maybe you could also be interested in studying a little bit more the OECD papers on that, on digital security, because they've been discussing this quite extensively also from an economical point of view, because it's not really possible and it's not really a sustainable solution just to update the technology and give up on the previous product and a smartphone or any other technology is not again a sustainable. So there's a lot of the myriad of other issues like the end of life and the light of life gap and how all of those issues could also be tackled to ensure the smooth, secure and safe use for the end users of that particular technology. Um, as Serge mentioned, there's a different um, up levels of the roles that both end users, manufacturers could do. Um, and I think that, again, I, I would really refer to the existing work um, that has been doing by the OECD. I think it will be really, really helpful to dig a little bit further in this topic. 
Thank you. Uh, Clara, before I come to you, I just wanted to uh, then invite all of the other speakers to take this last question as an opportunity to, to wrap up because we need to, to break, unfortunately. But uh, an interesting question was, uh, was, you know, came from the audience, which is on the you know, perspectives of threat slash human behavior, what are the implications of the next generation of cybersecurity policymakers who do not recall the pre-smartphone era? So we're now transitioning, you know, where there's a generational you know, transition that is happening even in the policy-making communities. So I'm just interested to get, you know, starting with Clara and then perhaps Anastasia and wrapping up with Serge, what is, you know, your perspective on this? Because it's, it's interesting to, to, to think about the, uh, how the policymaker as a, as a group is, is changing. I will just say that, you know, because of the potential human impact on, on of ICTs, you know, I mean, now it's not just technology and data. Now it's really, you know, impacting our human lives. I think the culture of innovation we've had, you know, to build quickly and break things, it's it's slowly sort of phasing out. Um, you know, the we have to find a way to innovate while we can think about the impact of technology. So, so I mean, it's, the, it's just a different perspective on, on the same thought that, that a certain Anastasia shared, that I think it used to be sort of okay when it was about data and money. I think that culture is slowly you know, evolving to ensure that, that technology is, is, uh, has the safety um, and security of the users in mind. You know, I think when it comes to, to the next generation of policymakers, it's, it's a topic I'm very passionate about and have been involved in this since about 2013, a different student competition specifically for policymakers, not the technical ones. Um, I think what I actually see, it's a very positive trend because cybersecurity is no longer taken as a topic apart. It's really taking together as part of any any role, any decision making, any policy making, any role you would have in a business, in a government, in a civil society. And what I'm also very encouraged by seeing that, you know, we on one hand, we have specialization, you know, when people really go into the field with having very particular degrees. I mean, the, the technical education is, is, is top notch that we have around the world. But now we actually have many more people who come to the field from other other fields, you know, communication, um, international affairs. I mean, I've met students of theology who are now doing cybersecurity policy, you know. So I think for me, what I see is important that we continue the specialization, but on the on the more soft side of cybersecurity, we really bring people from from sort of different backgrounds. And I think that is why I'm actually what I'm hopeful for, because 20, 25 years ago, and this is not reflection on anyone's individual capabilities. A lot of the policymakers came from the military background, right, because that's where those issues were treated. And I think for a long time, it did have a negative impact on the way we thought about this and framed this issue. But what I've observed in, you know, in the 12, 15 years I've been in this field is that it is now actually open to, to very different skill set. And, and, and we're finding great ways how to mix the technical talent with, with those other skill set, whether it's communication, being a translator between technical and, and policymaking community. So I'm actually pretty hopeful and the trends are, are very positive from my perspective. Thank you. Uh, we really need to close. So An Anastasia and Serge, if we can ask you 30 seconds each on this very interesting point about the generational change. Uh, please, Anastasia, over to you and then Serge. I think it's uh, what we've discussed so far. It's really important to bring different people with different perspectives. Um, bring people that understand the technology, bring people that are actually really good at understanding the policy and the human societal impact. Uh, bring people who have been dealing with the incidents. And I think it's one of the actually would be answers to the upcoming OWG. If we will be able to see different people coming together to discuss during the next five years, all of those highly complex and multifaceted issues. So um, diversity, it's really important. It's not just, I think, a buzzword. It's really important to ensure uh, in, uh, in dealing with these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Serge, over to you. My children got into an age when this, uh, where they started using the internet. This was the same time where everybody was saying, oh, the, the young generation, they, they put everything on the internet and they spoil their privacy. But it turned out not to be true. It turned out that this generation is actually quite good in distinguishing what should be public and what not. Obviously, there is a couple of 
of exceptions, but in general, they have a very good feeling of, of how this is going. And I think it's great that this generation is going to get started into the discussion because they actually know how all of this stuff functions and how it feels in the area. It's not something they look from the outside. There's a little bit of a danger that they take, that this generation takes a lot as a given. And so we, I would encourage people to always keep a critical eye on new to emerging technology, but that's always been the case. So all in all, I think it's good that we have more and more people talking policy that actually use this stuff in, in their daily lives, rather than kind of people that just look at this and are always amazed at this new technology. Thank you very much. And this is uh, uh, the, the end of this very interesting panel. Uh, thank you so much to uh, Serge, Clara and Anastasia for sharing your uh, precious knowledge and, and expertise with, with, with all of us today, both in person and, and online. Uh, we didn't cover all of the questions because some are probably most appropriate for uh, following panels, but we did tackle all of those that I thought could be appropriate for, for you to answer. Mm -hmm.